God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy A reading from Mark chapter 15. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemeth sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. Tonight, we remember the crucifixion of Jesus. And tonight, in my opinion, should be a night where we sit with our doubts and our lamentations more than any other night in the Christian calendar. And so tonight, when you listen to the laments that we are about to share, I wanna encourage each of you to sit with the doubt to sit with the lament, and rather than try to fix it or think of solutions, fully enter in to sit in the doubt so that we can really feel Jesus' cry, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani. Because I think that's the best way to honor the crucifixion every resurrection weekend. And so tonight, we invite you to sit with these doubts that are written from people of paradox. And I'm going to start with a lament I wrote called 56 Sabbaths. 56 Sabbaths, 56 Sabbaths in a row tomorrow that paradox will not meet in person for church. 56 Sabbaths in which the church on Cajon Street has now sat empty. Prior to 2020, the longest gap I had ever gone without attending a church service was 12 Sabbaths in a row when I traveled in Europe with Montana State University. I thought that gap in church attendance would never be topped in my lifetime, but here we are, in 2021, and I've surpassed that prior absence of church by 44 Sabbaths. Now a critic may hear this lamentation and say, what's the big deal, Craig? It's just church. But that critic does not know how much the people of Paradox mean to me and to each other. When I hear that we have not met in 56 Sabbaths, I think of all of the hugs that I have not received and all of the hugs I have not given. Think of all of the unscripted, impromptu conversations that bring a smile to my face as I hear about how life is unfolding for all members of the congregation. Think of all the times my heart stopped when an attendee says to me after church, Craig, please pray for me. I'm going through a rough patch right now. A major frustration about the past 56 Sabbaths is that the most deadly way to spread this disease is to get a bunch of people into a crowded room and sing together. Well, do you know what I love? I love getting a bunch of people together in a crowded room to sing together. I long to hear our community's voices singing awkwardly together as the band introduces a new song. And I want so badly to hear the voluminous confidence of our congregation when the band plays the hits like Vapor, Does Your Heart Break, and This Is My Mother's World. I miss hearing children running down the long hallways they burst into Paradox Kids. I miss the uneasy smiles that people give me as they bring their parents to Paradox for the first time. I miss the deliciousness of the refreshments from our hospitality team, the genuine smiles from our greeters, the silent commitment from our tech teams, and the handwritten letters that our BTS greeters wrote after the service to every person who attended our church for the first time. I am sad that we were not able to say goodbye as a community to some truly beautiful people as they moved to other parts of the country this past year. People like Kanda and Ricky, Joel, Jonathan, Arwa and Jeremy, and Ronson and Amy. I am sad that we cannot be together tonight on the night when we remember the cross and share our doubts with each other. While I'm looking forward to hearing the congregation's doubt in a little time, 
I, I can't shake the feeling that we should all be in the same room together right now. So when a critic objects and says, what's the big deal, Craig, it's just church, I want the critic to know that paradox is so much more to me than just church. Paradox is my home, my community, my friends, my family, and my people who challenge just about every sermon I give. I miss you too. Paradox gives me a sense of belonging in this small corner of Redlands that occupies a minuscule speck of the Milky Way galaxy. In other words, paradox for the past five years has made the unfathomable, unfathomable scale of the universe feel so much smaller, so much kinder, and so much more welcoming. And when par paradox disappears for 56 Sabbaths, then that absence disorients me. My friends, tonight, I am lamenting because I am lonely. And from one day one, paradox has helped me to feel less lonely in this world. I've struggled without the ritual of our church gathering in person, and I miss you. Whether you are sitting around this fire tonight or in your home watching this on a screen, please know that I miss you. And whenever, wherever you are, please know that I love you. I hope we can sing together again soon. to the darkness The fear will let you in The root of all exclusions Who is out and who is in Systems of belonging us in a cage You fear those who are different Refuse to see that
Growing up in faith-based education, I was pretty much indoctrinated with the idea that the world is full of beliefs that stand in direct opposition to my own. I was taught that any different belief is inherently disbelief, and that different belief was a threat to me and to what I perceived as my like-minded community. This was a really hard idea to kind of unlearn throughout the years, and I want to acknowledge that even as I ask the people in my community to kind of set those ideas aside just for today or tonight or even just the few minutes of my lament. We know that no one human truth can fully encompass the vastness of the divine, right? And we know that our truths and our beliefs are ultimately more like the context by which we live our lives. You can have beliefs that are really similar or really different from the person next to you, but no two lives are ever gonna be the same. And another thing I thought about in my lament is during my undergrad studies in writing, I learned about this idea of the suspension of disbelief. When we view art, consume stories, or share the creations and fictions and different truths that give our life beauty and meaning, we, we make this contract as consumers to suspend our disbelief, which means we make this decision to set aside our understandings of our own world or even the rules about how we think the world works in general in order to be really fully immersed in somebody else's experience. So tonight, as we're lamenting together, I'm asking you to suspend your belief. Tonight, to lament with me as a member of your community living in my own specific contexts and truths, to step into a piece of this experience, I'm asking you to believe, like I do, that you're living your one and only life. I don't believe in a physical afterlife or a heaven as a place or a new world. And I understand that this idea is really full of fear. It, it scares me too, but I thought that tonight while we're making room for our sorrow, we can also make room to sit with our fear. Um, I do fear death. I, th I think we all do, and in a lot of ways, our beliefs are kind of what allow us to shoulder that fear. You know, I, we can shoulder our fear if we believe that death is just asleep and that we'll close our eyes and wake up in this perfect world. We can shoulder our fear if we believe that we end this life and are born into a new life somewhere on the cycles of life in this earth. and. I can shoulder my fear if I believe that death, although final, is its own community. It's this natural experience and existence in the world that we share. You know, we're born, we're alive, and we're dead. This is a story that everyone who has come and gone before us also shares. So, I'm, tonight, I'm lamenting death. Not my own, although it makes me uncomfortable and a little scared, um, but the deaths inflicted by my own species, the human race. You know, we have this one miraculous, gorgeous, beautiful, perfect, one and only planet Earth. And when you enter into my belief, you look around at this planet and you see this wasteland that's been stripped and slaughtered and sold. And for what? All life and deaths, let alone mine as an individual, really cease to be natural or meaningful when we're living in this era of completely unnatural global climate catastrophe. And I, I just reach these points where I wonder, how do I shoulder this grief? How do I live in it alone? And what do I lean on when like the very foundation of what it means to be alive is melting out from under our feet? 
what is the use in reusing my grocery bags or shortening my showers when 71% of global carbon emissions are produced by just 100 mega corporations? And these are the same companies that are funding our government for their own benefit and for this like temporary hoarded human profit. What does it mean to be one citizen when half of my country is willing to sell and auction off our planet for like just the hope of maybe a tax cut leaking out of the next oil pipeline? What does my individual agency matter? And what does it mean to be an individual in a community of Christians who have so much hope for a new world that they won't really allow themselves to grieve the one we live in? And more personally, I wonder what does it mean to be a woman in my country? I, I really yearn for motherhood and to create and carry children. But the average carbon footprint of an American is 16 tons of CO2, which is four times the national average and eight times the goal if we want to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius by 2050, at which point the children that I'm yearning for would just barely be in their teens and 20s. I'm just, I'm asking you to imagine that kind of desperation or how much life-threatening hope or selfishness you have to have to bring a child into the world which is really just fulfilling this very natural and very very deep desire of love i just look at the world around us in this context and tell me where i find that kind of hope i'm lamenting for this earth because it's the only planet that i'm ever going to know i pray for courage I vote for change, and I hope to save what we have left before it's too late. But tonight I'm lamenting things that are just irrevocably lost. The vast knowledge of our indigenous brothers, sisters, and siblings who were systemically exterminated by centuries of the same capitalist ethics that have brought us to this point. They narrowly escaped complete genocide perpetuated in the name of Christ and white manifest destiny. I'm lamenting the habitat wastelands of the suburbs where I live, these concrete grids and these chemically blasted sterile lawns. And I'm lamenting the California habitats where I was raised. These communities were built on coastal sage scrub, which is now the most endangered habitat on the planet. I was even just thinking in my childhood when we would drive through the desert, we drove through clouds and clouds of yellow butterflies. and that that was before. You know, our insect populations have been decimated, which threatens the viability of birds and wildlife and biodiversity across our continents. And I've experienced these mass extinctions in just the first two decades of my life. I lament the lives that are created and destroyed without any kind of consequence or mercy in global meat industries. I lament oceans and forests and deserts and lakes. I lament the untainted natural world that we never, we'll never get to know. I lament the, the life lived in certainty by humans who could love and trust and believe in and care for this thriving and divine Mother Earth under their feet. I lament the free and healthy world that I have never and will never know. A world in which untouched forests are nurtured like a gift instead of viewed as potential palm oil profits, or a world that doesn't put price tags on water while humans, plants, and animals alike are dying of thirst just inches away from the well. I lament the loneliness of this kind of desperation surrounded by loved ones who have the luxury of leaning away from this action or this desperation because they can lean into their heavenly backup plans. I lament the world that I fear to bring my children into. I lament the burdens that they, like me, will place on the world through these systems of capitalist governance and profit-based development from which we can't really feasibly escape. I lament that to fully express the love that I have for life, I also have to evaluate and grieve its cost. That my children are going to be born with burdens that are already so heavy on their shoulders and on my heart. <laughs> I'm here tonight with my grief and just lamenting this immeasurable loss. 
I'm just, I'm here to make space for all of the love and the fear and the hope and the grief within me as I'm living my one and only life. doubt that I um, that I'm feeling is one that I felt throughout the whole year and uh, a doubt and lamentation that I felt in many of my conversations with people um, and uh, that really just has to do with um, how Christianity responded and I'm not uh, talking about uh, paradox I'm not talking about all churches right I think it looks different at the local level um, but what got the what got the loudest I had the loudest voice, I had the biggest platform and visual. Um, I had some serious doubts and frustrations with uh, the message that was sent and the opportunities that were missed this past year. Um, I think it just begins with, uh, I mean, we, we all made sacrifices, uh, or not all of us, but a lot of us did. Uh, we wanted to gather, right? Like we did feel lonely. And, uh, but we, we made those sacrifices because we felt it was the right thing to do uh, we felt that it was a compassionate thing to do, um, not just for the people who would gather with us, but for the people who don't gather with us. Because what, what we experienced this past year was um, just because I'm okay with the risk I take in my personal life, it's still going to affect you. And there's just so many layers of, of meaning um, with that. And um, this past year revealed uh, leadership in different organizations, uh, friendships, relationships, and and what did it reveal um, to the community this past year? Um, I felt it with the, the, the way that a lot of congregations insisted that we're gonna gather because we can, not because we should, but because we can, um, to approach it as if they were the victim of not being able to gather, um, rather than trying to not gather to protect people who were vulnerable. And, um, 
you know, putting a lot of vulnerable populations at risk who wouldn't have the same access to that, that maybe some of these churches would have if they did get sick. Um, and this past year also there was like this national reckoning with racism and um, people meeting, yes, outdoors publicly, but I'm thinking specifically where George Floyd died. That was a sacred space where people went to go mourn and reflect. And it was really frustrating when, um, when you have a religious figure, a singer, uh, goes there and just hijacks that sacred moment and drowns it out with noise that was so unnecessary at that time. And um, was again, we're gonna make it about us and not about what you need. Not about the compassion that um, Jesus would have had with you in this moment. It would just made it about them. Um, and it was more public gatherings again, as if they were the victims. Um, as if they're gonna do it just because they could and it was defiant, it was not compassionate, it was not gospel. Um, and again, it's not every congregation, it's not every single person, but it's just really unfortunate how uh, the message that was delivered was not one of love and compassion, it was a message of defiance. And uh, I just can't help that this past year could have revealed so many more beautiful things of what the church and religion could do. And it revealed more of the power they wants to preserve. Everything that's right 
feels wrong And all of my belief feels gone And the darkness in my heart is so strong Can you reach me here in the silence Singing these broken songs Looking for the light for so long But the pain goes on and on and on Can you reach me here in the silence Can you reach me here in the silence I've had my doubt I've struggled a lot with my mental health this past year. Choosing to practice social distancing meant letting go of hours spent with family around the dinner table, giving up hugs and missing in-person celebrations of weddings, births, and milestone birthdays, resigning to grieving away from loved ones rather than seeking comfort by gathering together. Yet while 2020 was immensely difficult, by last fall, I had settled into a routine that I found comfort and connection in. I was okay. Until Joe and I tested positive for COVID in late November. I've shared this before with Paradox, but those three weeks were the most difficult of my life. Scared to, je scared to death of Joe's persistent, never-ending fever, difficult and ragged breathing, and incapacitating fatigue. I spent too many evenings sitting in my car in the garage while he slept, bawling and game planning how to convince a hospital to let me stay if I needed to take him there. After three weeks, it was clear Joe would make a full recovery and while logically I knew we would be okay, my body, gut and heart has refused to believe it. I've wanted to hide from the world hold up in our home and never leave. Stay where COVID could never ever touch us again. Just be safe. But things like groceries and fresh air and movement are important. And so I had to venture out into the outside world and I have been terrified ever since. So terrified that sometimes I don't recognize who I am anymore. I have found myself in the bread aisle, tears streaming down my face because I'm sharing a shopping route with a woman who refuses to cover her nose with her mask. I've lashed out at a stranger, a man who held the door open for me at Barnes & Noble because he wasn't wearing a mask and I couldn't get past him without getting within inches of him. I found myself sobbing in Joe's arms because a loved one forgot about the pandemic and greeted someone outside their household with a huge hug and no mask. I am constantly terrified, but I also feel shame. So many of our friends have lost close loved ones from this virus. So many people are battling residual long hauler symptoms. And Joe and I came out of COVID relatively unscathed. We're both, we've both tested positive for antibodies. We've both received both doses of our vaccine. Neither of us has lasting physical symptoms or lost any to anyone to COVID. And so who am I to be so affected? We're okay. But I'm also not. My therapist calls it adjustment disorder. And with her help, I've been making a lot, a lot of progress. But I have to admit, with hope peeking out beyond the horizon, I'm actually terrified of normalcy. I'm scared that I'll never, ever again feel safe in a grocery store without a mask. I'm scared that I'll never be able to walk into a room without checking to make sure that everyone is following the rules. I'm scared that the first time Paradox meets in person, I will be in fight or flight mode the entire time and I won't be able to enjoy our time together. I'm scared of the possibility that no matter how normal we get, I will never actually feel safe from COVID. And that's all I want is safety. I just don't know what that looks like right now.
Our Friday night service is usually a time for a community to come together and just express doubt together. We usually all submit our doubts that we've pent up inside and have them read aloud and validated. In honor of that, we've asked for early submissions this year, and I have some of the doubts of our congregation. There's pain, uncertainty, but also love as we are together in this moment. Thank you for participating and taking time to hear what those around us are experiencing. I feel so unsure of my calling and how capable I am to do what's needed of me. It feels like it's never enough. My doubt is my child with mental illness will one day hurt himself or never get better, never have a job, never leave home, never have anything for himself and sadly, never know God. I've been a Christian my whole life and really enjoyed being a part of the body of Christ, but after seeing how this religion was co-opted to enable an entire political party's agenda for power and oppression of humans, I've been asking myself, is Christianity ultimately good? Is, there, is this something I want to be associated with? I'm starting to feel like the answer is no. I doubt that I'm wor a worthwhile human. I doubt that I bring much value to those around me and instead I am an emotional drain. I doubt I have inherent value and often wish that some great thing which to look back on and say, this was the impact I had. I doubt that there is meaning or purpose to be had in this world full of anger and division. While I don't doubt the mystical, metaphorical, mythical telling of Jesus' resurrection, I highly doubt that the literal, physical idea of Jesus being bodily returned to life. I often doubt that God exists, whether or not God is real. I still believe the recommendations from the Bible will still result in living a full, wonderful life. But to what end? If God isn't real and heaven might not be real, then while I live a good life, what is there to look forward to in the, the afterlife in the fact of death?
I'm not sure what God really thinks of me. On one hand, the Bible says she abhors sin, idolatry, faithlessness, and turns her face from those who do this. These are traits that I manifest daily. Then there are other passages where God thinks lovely things towards me. Sometimes I get the feeling God isn't being transparent with me. The silence is confusing and her permissiveness feels dismissive. There are so many stories in the Bible that make me feel like this whole God thing is made up. I'm afraid that I have strayed too far and I can no longer be saved. Heaven's gates won't open up for me anymore. I am trying to work with an oppositional co-parent. I have prayed for seven and a half years for a miracle for our family, that hearts will be softened, reconciliation will transpire, and that love will win. So discouraged with so little progress, I want to feel that God cares about broken hearts. Mm -hmm. With all of the suffering from this pandemic, it's hard to believe that God is alive and that God is good. What if God really is the vengeful, angry God of the Old Testament? Am I really good enough? Sometimes I feel like everyone else could be doing everything I do better than me. In the midst of COVID, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness. Now I wonder how long I have left to live. Will I have time to gain a better understanding of life after death so I can adjust my thoughts accordingly? Will I live to see the next generation? I wonder if organized religion does more harm than good in this world. I'm dealing with depression because I am having increasing difficulty with walking and doing the simplest household chores. I've doubted if all of my efforts in making wise choices is even worth it. I once knew your father well He taught tears as he spoke of your mother's help I guess a part of him just couldn't return Forgiveness is a lesson he cursed you to learn And as your guardian, I was instructed well To make sense of God's love in these fires of hell Just to live a little life, your broken heart kid. And maybe your light is a seed in the darkness, the dirt. 
In spite of the uneven odds, beauty lives from the earth, from the earth, from the earth. As the years move on, these questions take took her away For the weight of the world's place on your shoulders that day It may be the light is a seed in the darkness Fight of the uneven odds, beauty lives from the You're much too young now, so I'll write these words down. Darkness exists to make light truly come. You know, when I was growing up, I was told that doubt was the enemy of faith. And here at the very heart of our tradition, uh, our symbol of our tradition is the cross. And on the cross is the most doubt-filled statement probably in all of our tradition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if any of you have felt doubt, I hope that you always know that there is a place for you by the fire. And a place where you can talk and be accepted and be willing to sit in your doubts with each other. And that is when Christianity is at its very best. And that is what I believe is meant when Jesus Christ said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him.